Questions? Peter, do I understand that the brine pond would be on the right-hand side of Route 14? It's on the lake side of the road. Oh. That slope, that very steep slope. I think it. I think I've seen documents that say that at one point it's 12 12 percent, which is really steep. I think that must be at the deeper end of it. But I do know this, that the, uh, the lake side of the pond is going to require a, I think it's a 36 foot, 32 or 36 foot dam. Yeah. And the, the other side, the part that's closest to the road, is going to require almost a 30 foot cut into, they're going to cut into it there. So it's, a, it's definitely a slope piece of property, but that's what energy owns. Oh, very scary. They're not, they're not building a pond, they're building a dam. Yeah. You know, that's, it's not like know, a farm pond. You know, it's interesting that I saw a DEC comment saying, that, oh, this is going to require a dam permit. And um, then I, I found that, um, that within a day or two of that decision, an, an attorney, a Syracuse attorney for energy, met with some people in the DEC, and the DEC issued a correction the next day saying, oh, <laughs> we're not actually going to use your... And there, there may be perfectly legitimate reasons for that, and it may have been an, an error. But it was amazing how quickly the company responded and the DEC responded to the company. And it does seem like it might be a qualify for a damn permit, just on general common sense. <laughs> <clears throat> so my question is, I'm not, I'm not clear on, it's, it's liquefied petroleum gas or liquefied propane gas, LPG, what is it? L LPG stands for liquefied petroleum, petroleum, petroleum gas. gas. Yeah. And it's usually propane and butane and some of the other right. minor, minors of the other. And it's a byproduct of, of production of oil and gas, is that right? It, and natural gas. And natural gas. Yeah, it. it you know, it, it, there's a process that it goes through, but it is originating from these Marcellus uh, wells in Pennsylvania right now. I mean, that's the that's what they're expecting to serve. And how is it used? The propane and the butane. The well, LPG. How is I it mean, used? I mean, a lot of it would be uh, heating and things like Most that. Of it's residential heating. Yeah. So, but it's different than liquid natural gas. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there are but actual would, liquid natural gas storage sites nearby. There's one further up the lake from this site that's a nice egg site that's in active use right now. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting, liquid natural gas in storage does not have a history of, uh, uh, of incidents, you know, fires, explosions, deaths, and things like that, that liquid right. propane gas has. The liquid petroleum gas, the protein, butane, ethane, all those things are much more dangerous as flammable fluids than is, than is natural gas, even in its liquid form. Yes. Yeah. Peter, you did say the the nice egg site that you mentioned is, did um did energy buy that site? Yeah. I, was that the comment NYSEG that you is made? Owned by a by a Spanish corporation, and they sold they sold I believe it's some either some caverns or some old wells that were storing natural gas. This is not LPG. Okay. Although I'm told that. There has been some storage of LPG on this site previously. I haven't gotten the details on that, but maybe somebody in the audience knows the answer to that. Does anybody know whether LPGs have been stored at the Watkins site previously? Anybody know? Anybody from the company or anything? No? Well, that's something I need to look okay. into, but I heard that today that there actually has been some of it stored there. But their NYSIG has stored natural gas very near that site for quite a while. And in 2000, about a year ago, um, Energy bought out um, NYSIG. And it also bought, with that, it bought, I think, a compressor station and two pipelines. As part of a deal, it's like $65 million. Because there is that big complex right there where 14 and 14A meet. And there's yep. the, po the brine pond right on the site there now. Right. Mm -hmm. how, how, do you know what the proximity is of this site to that? Oh, it's very close. Yeah. It's, okay. I, I don't know if you know the geography, but, but uh, 14A kind of bends around mm -hmm. and comes over 14. It, as you are making that, that turn on the exit, you're curving around, right. you, could, you could take a stone and toss it into the pond practically okay. from that 
curve there. It's right there by the by the road. Gabriel's okay. Junction is what they used to call it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right Underground Railway. Underground Railway. <clears throat> One other question, Wayne Bell. Where are the where are the actual salt caverns in relation to that intersection? Well, the the salt caverns is, you know, I would love to see a map of the salt caverns, but they don't make those available. Okay. Excuse and, me, Peter. Could you use the mic? Yeah. Um, I, they don't make maps generally available, at least not to me, because I, you know, I've tried to to look at them. Because uh, I think it'd be really interesting to know how vast are the caverns? Do they go under the lake at all? Mm -hmm. Um, you why, talked about. Why is that? Why don't they have them available? Well, in all my, my, my battles with FOIA, one of the things that also came up was national security issues. Um, so, I don't know. Take your pick. Hi. So, when I first heard about this pond, the first thought I had is that I lived out in Ellis Hollow in the 1970s. And I don't know how many people's memories go back that far. I'm getting senior. <laughs> but um, we had, I think, two 100-year rainstorms in the middle of two different summers. I had two cars wash away down my stream. There were chicken coops washing down Slaterville Road. You know, the stories go on and on. They'd be in the Ithaca Journal. But I have no idea how this pond works if we happen to have a couple of huge rainstorms. And all we have to do is also think about Queensland, Australia, mm -hmm. and their issues with rain. And I think this pond is a disaster. Well, I, I will say that there, the vice chairman of the, the um, Reading Planning Board agrees with you. And he said, I'm going to vote against this whole project unless you move that brine pond to the other side of the Route 14 to, to an area that's flatter. So he agrees with you. And, I don't know enough. I, I'm, I don't have enough scientific background to say, you know, wh what is the threshold of danger that's acceptable? But they've got the DEC and the company have gone back and forth on this question. So. I actually live across the street from where this is all going to take place. So, mm. and, and I just moved to the area. So this is like a big shocker to me uh, because I probably wouldn't have bought the house. Um, <laughs> But, um, you know, one of my questions is where we live, um, we already tend to have a shortage of water. So if they're now talking about building a brine pond across the street, uh, how much water is that going to pull off of my property down into this pond? Um, in ter and then, in, obviously, in terms of the obvious dangers of having a gas I, I may storage. Be, I may be winging this, but I, I think that... Um, when they do the solution mining, what they do is they drip fresh water into the, into the salt and, they, and gradually they make the caverns bigger because it, it turns into brine. I think that water is just coming out of the lake. They're allowed to take a certain amount of water out of the lake and discharge stuff into the lake too. And part of their, part of their um, permit from the DEC would include a stormwater management plan. I mean, they have to very carefully manage stormwater and plan for worst case scenario big storms in terms of stormwater management running off the land into that pond. The pond can probably take a foot of water or so if there was a foot of rain, but you want to mitigate the runoff so the runoff doesn't go into the pond and make it overflow and wash brine down the hill into the lake, obviously. My comment is that we have how many hazardous waste sites in New York right now and we all know that we are who pay, and energy is a limited liability corporation. That's how they always get around it. LLC, mm -hmm. right there in their name. I have a question while I'm moving the mic. You know, a lot of safety issues can be mitigated by redundancy, backup systems, so there isn't just yes. one blow-up preventer, you know, mm -hmm. that there should be multiple safety measures taken with this. I just want to ask Peter, it, it sounded as though they were unwilling to provide you with their information about what kind of safety systems they were installing. Is, is that what you said? I don't know what's in the parts of the report that they didn't give me. I can just, you know, just try to make guesses based on what the titles were. But I... Um, 
I, I just really don't know how to answer that. I, I just don't know what was in them. Okay, thanks. So I think I went to one of the meetings in the town of Reading. They scheduled in the Watkins, or uh, excuse me, Elmira Star Gazette, and it was scheduled for a Wednesday. And I went to the Wednesday meeting, and it was not until Thursday. So I was kind of disappointed by the announcement in the paper that that was incorrect. But I went back on Thursday also, and the folks from Energy that were Entergy that were there. And they claimed it was methane and butane that they were going to store in the caverns. And they were totally unprepared because all the guys dressed in suits hadn't even notified the local landowners around the proposed site as required by law. So they looked pretty dopey that night. But I kind of let it go because I live in Hector. I'm on the other side of the lake. I'm like three miles as the crow flies. So I think what we need to do is, as far as, this is just comments, until we get a three-dimensional map of how far these salt caverns go underneath our world, no one should have any say of what we store underneath the ground. The brine pond is the least of our concerns. The brine pond will probably stand an earthquake. That's that's the least of it. You've got to be paying attention to what they're pumping underneath the ground. And I'd like to know if Seneca Lake is 800 feet deep, then how f much farther below these shale formations and depth of storage, because you were talking about fracture zones. And I'm, I'm a stonemason. I work at Cornell University. I'm not scared. They They tell us how the Devonian shale works and how this shale layer works and why the salt layer is here. So let's find out how far below this, what they're pumping underneath us actually is. I just strictly comment, I guess. Do either of you know how deep the salt caverns are? I think they're about 5,000 feet. They're pretty far down. I didn't know that they were, they were that deep. I, I would not. not have guessed that deep. But because, uh, you know, if, if you go that deep, you're starting to get down to the Marcellus Shale level they were around going, here because yeah. it gets a lot shallower in that area. Below the they're below the Marcellus and the Trenton Black River and the other Devonian shales. Oh, are yes. they? Trenton Black River is like 2002, Very deep. Well, maybe that's too deep then. But they're, they're below Marcellus. We know that for a fact because Marcellus is fairly shallow here. Yeah, exactly. They're deep. <laughs> as opposed to the caverns. Most of the caverns, like the nice egg caverns, aren't nearly as deep as that. We worked on the uh, NYSEG uh, Seneca Lake Storage Project back around 1995, and uh, well, we worked against it, um, but we were too little too late. Why did NYSEG uh, sell that? I'm quite wondering. They were so insistent that they needed this for natural gas storage to, to supply Binghamton, which was in a recession, but why did they uh, sell this if it was successful, and I'm concerned that maybe it was too leaky or it was unsuccessful and it's not suited for storage. What, I, what I've seen is you have to remember that NYSEG is owned by a, a uh, right. company that's based in Spain and that this, was, this had to do with totally different issues. So it was just a business deal? I think so. I mean, at least that's how it was represented in the a press release I remember reading. It was, you know, it was... It, it was out of the out of the, the corporate parent that was saying, "We're doing we're doing this uh, divestiture as part of a a plan to get out of certain business areas." So it it didn't seem to be as specific okay. as you were asking. Okay, I have a separate point about um, for uh, private landowners, and that is that this infrastructure is already been extending to having uh, companies be declared public utilities, and then gaining the right of taking people's land by eminent domain, uh, Google Spectrum um, company. This has already happened in Clearville, Pennsylvania. And I'm really concerned about the spread of all of the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, Peter, could you please comment on the role of Tom Reed, the 29th congre congressional representative well, I mean, in this? 
I don't want to read too much into this at all. <laughs> no, seriously, I, I, because I've, I've looked at it and I've and I've tried to find, you know, I, I've I've tried to follow it. But it is interesting that um, the little town of Reading has an attorney, and so does the little town of Savona, and it's the same man, and it is Tom Reed. I haven't seen him do, you know, anything, you know untoward with either of these so I, I in fact I haven't seen him really take any action I haven't seen his name on any of the papers or anything but it, he he says on his his disclosure documents that he is the town attorney uh, for those two tiny little towns and it just happens to be where these salt storage caverns are so I don't I don't know what it means and it may mean nothing I bought some property over there three years ago tomorrow, about oh, a mile from this proposed facility. And I just found out about this January 2nd. I, I was, I don't know what I was doing. I was dinking around on the internet and I came across your uh, October 18th piece and uh, it changed my, my January considerably. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm curious, I don't know, I'm an outsider. I don't live over there. Um, I don't know how many people in this room are from over there and, and not Ithaca, but when did when did you find out? A week ago. A week ago, and I'm I'm curious. <laughs> I mean, I know after kind of doing a little bit of you know backwards research here, there were uh, notifications in the the Review and Express, but it's really nothing that would really draw much attention. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm kind of curious. I haven't been to any of the meetings. Um, is this is there like any positive spin? Like, are they throwing any bone out to the to the local people? There are going to be X amount of jobs created. I, I read somewhere like ten jobs. Um, I, I just see a, a boatload of downside and no potential upside for the local people. Um, now, along that line, the comments are due on the thirty first. My comments are in, it, and maybe you understand this process better than I do. Uh, Mr. Bimber from the DEC was very forthcoming and, you know, uh, suggested I get acquainted with the seeker process, which um, if, I don't know if anyone's tried to do that, but that's, that's, a, that's a whole nother exploration. But, so we have our comments in by the 31st. So that's the, the draft environmental impact statement. Then the DEC looks at all of this stuff and then they put out the the, the revised proposal that we can then comment on again? Well, this is a scoping document. I would, everyone should become familiar with this. It's uh, called Draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement Draft Scoping Outline. All they are is looking for points that should be included in the Draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. They haven't even gotten to the point of writing the statement yet. They're just looking for input from the public of what should be included. Uh, most of my presentation, by the way, was based on the same outline they have here in this document. That's what I use for an outline in my presentation. So how many more opportunities will we get to comment in any kind of meaningful way before they break ground on this thing? If they have to do a, 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 a GIS, which it looks like they're going to have to do, based on the DEC decision, there will be public hearings with comment periods usually 30 to 60 day comment periods. Uh, and again, this is, I don't expect anybody to have a real answer to this, but let's just assume or pretend that fracking doesn't happen in New York State. Um, what's the likelihood that this company would want to go forward with, with this project if, if that were out of the picture? I would think they still do it because they, their gas is coming from Pennsylvania right now. And Pennsylvania is going full tilt. And people in Pennsylvania are talking about a moratorium, but who knows, since they're already three years into gas production, if they ever get a moratorium. I, I agree with Tom on that. I think it's uh, the company is going to go ahead with it, most likely. Can I ask, Tom, do you know if this is Marcellus coming from the other corner of Pennsylvania that's wet gas? Is, that, is there a pipeline that's bringing it up to this area? I think they're piping it up. But I'm not sure what they're doing. I don't know how it gets here, but um, I do know that um, in that, remember I made a reference to the, uh, the, uh, the call that they had with analysts 
in that the, the, uh, the executives of energy made some comments. And one thing that they said was that we are looking to take advantage of the development of the Marcellus Shale, you know, at that point in Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. but obviously New York eventually. There, um, all across the southern tier, there are building short pipelines up from Pennsylvania to take advantage of the already existing infrastructure of pipelines that go across the state. Um, the TEPCO pipeline runs from Watkins Glen all the you know to New England. Um, I don't remember where it goes west. Um, Eastern Steuben County is like a major, major intersection of probably a hundred pipelines, small and large. It's like the giant, a giant interstate, um, and um, partly because I think Corning Incorporated uses a whole lot of gas, but you know, g g they pipe it from Canada across New York State to to Boston, um, and uh, it, it, you know. Go, go online and look for maps of pipelines, and you will be astounded at how many pipelines already exist. And so now they're just doing little interconnections. And then occasionally the pipelines get shut down for repair, so then they need to truck the gas all over everywhere. And, and Energy is, um, it is also a big pipeline company. They're very mm -hmm. involved with local pipelines and expanding their pipeline network here. Uh, so that's, it's not just storage, it's the combination of the two for, for energy. Mm -hmm. And energy, by the way, it, it's spelled I-N-E-R-G-Y if you're trying to Google it or anything. And sometimes gets confused with another energy company called Entergy, E-N-T-E-R-G-Y. I don't know what that is, but it's another mm -hmm. energy company. Can you tell me why one needs to store the brine in a pond and not in another cavern underground? The underground cabins are all filled right now, or mostly filled, with brine. And <laughs> so they have to take the brine out in order to put the, the LP gas, liquid petroleum gas, in. And then they need to put it back in when the gas comes out in the winter in order to fill up the hole again. So there's this whole process they have to go through, which requires the pond. I mean, they could build giant above-ground storage tanks, which would be uh, much safer for storage of the brine, but they'll never do that in a million years because it's really expensive. Uh, so I had a question for the panel. Apparently, uh, my favorite paper, the Elmira Star Gazette, <laughs> announced a $29 million federal stimulus grant to some company over towards Reading Center to uh, do a compression test with, they claimed the company was going to use off-peak electricity to pump air into caverns and then during peak energy crisis, whatever, they would let the, the, air, the compressed air back out and generate energy through turbines through compressed air using the salt domes. Mm -hmm. $29 million is a lot of money. Does that have anything to do with what we're talking about this evening or is that a totally different? I have no idea. I don't either. I know it's a technology that's, tr that's being tested and developed by several companies. So it's not novel by any means. It's att attaining practicality. Yeah I, I, <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I just want to respond to a question before why we don't get uh, maps and uh, things like uh, we should be able to get. In the early 90s, there was this chemical right to know legislation. Tom probably knows about it. Right. And all. Uh, uh, storage facilities, all hazardous generators of chemical uh, things. They had to uh, work with the fire agencies, the emergency agencies in their area. They also had to have evacuation maps. If there was a, if you were storing a gas and the air was blowing a certain way, how far away would it go? And well, this all changed after 9/11. You know, they already the, the uh, federal government started writing to libraries asking for a lot of documents back, even. Uh, Things like reservoir maps. I don't know if you remember this. Uh, like a couple of months after 9-11, someone was arrested for taking a picture of a reservoir. So uh, this is why we can't get access to a lot of things. They're uh, subject to 
terrorism. So, I mean, so all the people are held hostage to this, you know, thousands and thousands of facilities that could be dangerous that we aren't going to know about uh, because, you know, a terrorist might do something to them. So. And I do think that tends to be a pretext, too, because I, I don't yes. think there's, there's really a significant uh, uh, threat of terrorism in Reading, New York. Except by energy. <laughs> <laughs> That's separate. Have any of the wineries weighed in on this? I mean, there, there must be wineries on the west side of Seneca Lake, just as they are on the east side. And this, I mean, has got to be bad for business. Is it Lakewood that's right there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I, I, have sp I have talked to people at Lakewood, and they were not very concerned about it. Um, you know, it's, it's very interesting when you talk to winery and, and vineyard uh, owners around uh, the Finger Lakes. Some of them are very, very concerned about um, where we're headed with, with gas drilling and all the all the things that go with it, and some of them are unbelievably ignorant. And, um, and I, I think they're dangerously ignorant given the potential impact on their business, I think. And, I, and I'm really puzzled why the, the industry has not, the, and the wine industry has not gotten together and spoken with some voice on this. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's almost, it, it's really notable that they have not, spoken out it taken some position but as for this on this project i mean even the, even the people that are a mile away are not that concerned about it yeah be, because it seems to me that the big issue here is i mean yes the technical problems with the impoundment and so on and so forth but uh, it seems to me the larger issue is the industrialization of the finger lakes you know and that mm -hmm. you know at, at from many different yeah. sources and many different Levels. Well, that brine pond is is probably less than a mile away from their tasting room, so uh, you would think that they would put two and two together there. Um, and um, uh, there are several different major publications from the federal government, uh, USDA and so forth, about ground level ozone and its effect on crops. And wine and grapes for wine are always one of the prominent crops listed is very susceptible to failure, plant failure, because of ground level ozone. So they're going to have a billion trucks and rail cars burning diesel going in and out, making VOC like mad right next to their winery. And if they have problems with their plants, they're going to sit there and scratch their head and wonder why? I don't know. Right. It's, it's, it's the left hand not knowing what the right hand is doing. It's the same thing with the TMDLs, the total maximum daily loads for mm -hmm. sediment going into Chesapeake Bay. Right. <coughs> TMDLs being imposed, and yet um, uh, development of the Mar development of the Marcellus in Pennsylvania, New York, is going to create more stormwater runoff. It, it's mm -hmm. inevitable because they're going to clear forests, and uh, so it's like you know they're, they're not putting two and th somebody is not putting two to two and two together, you know, someplace. I just wanted to make a comment about the uh, vintners and. Um, Farmers around here, they're, they're very busy people year-round, and I don't think they've been out to as many community forums as they should be, but um, there are two upcoming um, events that will be targeted toward that population, and hopefully they'll wake up and realize the danger to their, to their livelihood and the beauty of their region. I had a question about railways. <laughs> um, what kind of railway development are we talking about here, and where where's that money going to come from? Is the federal government going to um, pump up railways so these companies can rail things in? I don't know that there's going to be any change in the rail lines themselves, or they're going to put in those spurs that, but they're you know a couple hundred yards long, maybe, right there on the site that's owned by Energy. But it, as far as I know, nobody's you know, planning on building a new bridge over the Watkins Glen Gorge or anything. It's, um, right now, it's a Norfolk Southern line, and they do annual checks of all their rail. And they do pay particular attention to that bridge. Um, at least I, I've, I've read that in a, in, a, in a letter written by an energy attorney. He said they do, they do really watch that. But I don't know any more. 
the rail line already runs by the site. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, the thing, the last summer, I, I live, I well, don't live, I own property about 200 yards from the rail line. And in the summer, I, I smelled tar. And that's strange. Where's that coming from? So I walked through my neighbor's property and up to the, the rail line. And, and apparently, and I had no knowledge of what might be coming, um, they're all new railroad ties on the line and all new gravel bed straight down through Irelandville. I, I don't know about the rest of the line, but I, I you know, don't know if that means anything, but, but they were definitely doing some maintenance this past summer on the line. Um, th this is just a, a pretty simple question. I was trying to make sure I understood why salt formations were so important. So one of the things you've talked about is that it's easy to mine out caverns. You can dissolve caverns. Is there anything about the salt formation that is special in terms of the containment of these materials, or is it just the ease of developing caverns at depth that makes them desirable sites? I think the salt is, makes a pretty impervious barrier to migration with no cracks or faults or fissures around. You know, it's a solid mass of salt. It's like putting it in a glass vessel, basically, because it will contain the gas very readily. Unless you have some dissolution of water and migration away from the site, of course. There are always ifs. Bill Capel, who's a geologist, said to me that salt is plastic, uh, meaning that that makes it, you know, has, I guess, some flexibility and uh, some durability to pressure. Is that what he meant? I, I think so, yeah. It does have some plasticity, but it's a very, very slow process. There have been instances of one salt... Uh, cavity uh, caving and opening into another salt cavity and releasing the liquid propane stored, liquefied propane gas, petroleum gas stored in that cavity into other places it wasn't supposed to go with a consequence loss of gas. I mean, there have been instances of failures underground of cavity storage. They didn't affect above ground, but it caused a loss of product underground. Um, Tom, you alluded to this a little bit uh, in your presentation about the seepage of radon into the um, into the, the brine. I'm wondering, with all of the um, the talk that there has been about the produced water n necessarily being stored in contained tanks, how is it that how different are the constituents of this um, these cavern mine brines? to the produced waters, and how if, if, if they're not all that different, how can we get away with having open brine pits, um, 14 acres in, in, in area, with all of the predictable dangers to, to waterfowl and whoever comes by? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. I think uh, the, brine that's, the brine that's put down there uh, originally was made by putting water down, dissolving the salt in place. So it has relatively contact with the rock stratum above and below the salt layers, and relatively little amount of uh, contamination from those other layers that might have hydrocarbons in, for example, that could contaminate the, the brine solution. But I think we still have to be concerned about radon, as you mentioned, and maybe a few other uh, normal, naturally occurring radioactive products called NORM you know, making some of that brine radioactive. It would be interesting to see if any studies have been done on the radioactive content of brine stored underground for a long time. These are all hard questions to answer to which nobody really knows the answer. I'm just well, taking a guess at some of this stuff. I, I will say that um, the, in my perspective anyway, just my perspective, it, I think the DEC tends to have a see no evil view toward norm in general. They just mm -hmm. don't like to test it. And um, it was actually the, the New York City Department of Environmental Protection that urged them to, um, to actually test the Marcellus wells in New York State to test the brine. Say, why don't you check and see how radio, radioactive they are? They are. Mm -hmm. Now, there are only about a dozen Marcellus wells right now in New York State, and it turned out that when they the DEC being prodded by the New York City DEP, uh, went and tested. They found out, oh, look at this. Some of these are 250 times the, you know, the levels that, are, <laughs> that you're allowed to release into the environment. So they were very highly radioactive, and it was radium-226, which is bad. And um, 
So, I mean, it's an issue. Hey, well, you know, now we also, this is maybe a tangent, but uh, we're also, we've got the issue of Casella um, getting regulatory permission from the DEC to accept these uh, drill cuttings from Marcellus Wells in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, for whatever reason, they're not, that stuff is not staying in Pennsylvania. It's coming across our border and it's being stored in, in right now three landfills. They want to go for four. They're right now in the process of trying to get the Steuben County landfill. They want to store this stuff in landfills that are not licensed to handle radioactive waste. And it's, again, it's a see no evil. They say, well, we don't know whether they're radioactive. And, and now Casella mm -hmm. has hired um, people to say that they've done testing and it's all fine. <laughs> um, but what's the DEC doing? So anyway, I know it's a tangent, but um, norm's a big issue that's that's yeah. underplayed. Yeah. Is this considered underground injection, and is does the EPA become involved? No, what? I don't think so. It's not not an injection well. Injection wells are usually for the storage of waste. Yeah, I think that's right. So even though it's under pressure, they don't consider it. Yeah. What's it say? Yeah. Um, I just wanted to add uh, something um, optimistic into this very cool. <laughs> depressing conversation that we are having. I'm, I'm Pam Mackesy. I'm from Tompkins County. Um, and one of the things that we are beginning to do uh, at the county level here, um, we have begun to recognize, uh, I mean, we've been very active in the whole issue of gas drilling um, in, in New York State and, and in the Finger Lakes region. And so one of the things that, uh, I'm the chair of the planning committee for the legislature and the department, the planning department, um, is beginning to try and put together some, some ideas about developing a Finger Lakes region um, economic development concept of actually having something to look forward to. That we have these, uh, we first place we have all of the um, wineries that are, are that are have been springing up like mad, but we also have a tremendous amount of uh, agricultural land that is not being used, and that perhaps coming up, you know, of, uh, of with all of biofuels being. Uh, developed and the possibility of farms being able to grow this, uh, the 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 grasses and whatever else that is, uh, are decide that we decide to use, but that of trying to have something that we sh have as an alternative to this ghastly um, uh, industrialization of our region, and so I just wanted to put that out there. It's just at an, at an absolute embryo state, and we don't even know how well that, that how it will be developed. But it's something that I was very excited about when I, I was talking to um, Ed Marks, the uh, uh, planning uh, director here, and and I think it's something that that we all share. We are sharing all of this agony, and that we we sh we are very similar in our in our economic uh, need here, our rural areas. So, uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Right. Back to the injection well issue. Um, the last page of the of the uh, scoping documents uh, says that uh, U.S. Uh, under agency uh, environmental protection agency injection control uh, class two X, whatever that means. So they may need some kind of injection control permit. Now, whether that's the same as a regular injection well, I don't know. I don't know much about that technology at all or regulation. Um, incidentally, one of those 12 wells that they, uh, that they tested for norm, in fact, I, I think, as I remember right, it, it was the one that w scored the highest in terms of uh, norm was guess where it's it's right there in the vicinity of the uh, the salt plant now it may be as far as a mile away but it's not much more than that if it's that I think it's less than a mile away so highly radioactive at least in that one well the brine in that one well 
state land. The state forest land is the one that's 254 times the level of this. It, it could be, it's, but I, I know the one that, right, that is right near the salt plant is also very high. I, I still think it might be the highest, but I'll have to yeah. check. <clears throat> Because there's so many people here, um, not from Tompkins County, but from much closer to the area where this proposed facility is going to be built, I'm wondering if you would like to spend the last few minutes of this meeting um, sort of identifying one another and getting your heads together to think about how you might organize a meeting in your town or, or how you might work in some coordinated way with others. Would that be helpful to you? Sure. Well, uh, in order to do that, could all the people who are from Watkins Glen stand up so at least you can look around the room <laughs> well, and see who's Schuyler. here? Schuyler County. Schuyler County. Schuyler. Okay. Schuyler County, everybody. The lobby out front is empty. If people would like to use that space to convene all the people from Schuyler, and at least you can look at each other and we'll have a list. You can trade um, contact information. Um, so uh, maybe just before we do that, I would like to ask everyone to thank Tom and uh, the speakers. so much. I think we've all learned a tremendous amount uh, from their research and their presentation today. And uh, I thank you all for coming. I dare say this probably won't be the first presentation or the last that you'll have on this topic. Thanks so much. Have a nice time. Thank you.